Previously on Chaos Head Noah. I am And the way she talked, you wouldn't think we were talking about her literal name. Having to teach her something so basic, like day one stuff, was just... Thinking about where this was going to lead just left me feeling even worse than before. Being honest with myself, Rimi was cute, as she is. She also said she would protect me, and I too wanted to stay with her forever if I could. But this was all fake, a lie. This life wouldn't last. And Rimi wasn't Rimi. Our time would be far too short-lived, far too fleeting. The thought of it made me feel sad, wistful, and empty. I couldn't help but whisper those words. Ever the mood killer, huh, Sayratan? I was taken by surprise. I'd heard Sayratan's voice come from my PC. I just received an email from someone. A voice. Was coming from the speaker. Countless other Rimis were collapsed on the ground, almost as if this place were a burial ground. And every single one of them was dead. This was a graveyard, the graveyard of her heart. That was how it felt to me. Suddenly, countless bubbles sprang forth before my eyes, and within each and every one of them, I could see different visions being displayed. An instinctive realization came to me, and I knew then that these were Rimi's dead memories. Rimi. Rimi no Rimi nodded, and then she embraced me. I buried my face in her chest, the feeling of her soft, supple breasts spread across my cheeks. Gravity soon disappeared, and the two of us began drifting along the blue. Still lying on the ground, Rimi held me as she gently stroked my hair. I couldn't describe how wonderful that felt. It was as if the very essence of all her kindness and warmth was enveloping me. It reminded me of how I felt when my mom hugged me back when I was a kid. How safe I'd felt in her arms. I wanted to stay like this forever, but at the same time, I wanted to confirm for myself that she was really was Rimi, so I turned my head just enough to look at her face. Thank 
くみに心を救ってもらって今度はタクに心を助けてもらってだから今度こそ私があなたたちを守る I still don't understand what she meant by Taku and Takumi. But what I did know was that if she were, was there to protect me, I wouldn't need to worry about anything more. She was a gigglomaniac, and she would keep me safe. No matter what Shogun had asked her to do, she'd be able to pull it off. As long as I was with her, that'd be enough for me. I'm going to try. 頑張って、罪滅ぼしもするし、あなたたちからの恩にも、報いるから。死ぬつもり、なんだね。If there was a th way to fix things without dying, I would have done it. 彼が目覚めなかった以上、僕にはどうすることもできない。だからせめて。僕の最後の妄想を君にな何言ってるのあなたはそんなことしなくても You know he had no presence in this place Rimi shouted at the person she was speaking to 君だけを死なせるわけにはいかないよ全ての元凶は僕なんだからもういいんだリミーノロセオ殺してほしいノアツーを破壊してほしい僕がサポートするからリミーステーフサンクントゥーラップシーワイプトウェイヘーティーズデスパイドグローインモーモーディスントゥーエリパーシングサクント She did everything in her power to hold on to her consciousness. Nerose's lips twisted. Keeping the collapsed girl surrounded by fluttering feathers within his sight, he formed a delusion. He, str his str he strengthened his grasp on his D sword and opened his channel into the Dirac Sea. The particles and antiparticles needed to materialize his delusion. Had now been created. And from those two collections, only the particles, through the signals of light that were established as sight, were sent into Sagiyama Rimi's dead spots. <laughs> oh! In a single instant, the fluttering feathers transformed into eyes. Until this very moment, the only eyes watching him had been Rimi's. But now, he was surrounded by an innumerable number of floating eyes. She said it! She said the thing! It was the last delusion Takumi had bestowed upon her. Now I understood. I understood what she meant by those words. How much she wished for such a simple life. When I thought back on everything, I realized that the time I'd spent with her had only been a few hours in total. But I had loved every second of it. I was always happy when I was with her. To me, who had gone through every day all alone as a shut in, living as though I was dead. Rimi's smile had been my sole source of hope. It told me that a bright future existed ahead of me. Rimi had smiled for my sake. 
so now she should smile for her own sake. I believed she would come back, but this wasn't my usual escapism, hoping to avoid reality. No, this was my resolve. I would believe only in her, for she had promised me she would be with me forever. So, get moving. Move your ass, Nishijo Takumi. And now, the conclusion. Greetings, my name's Neo Second, and welcome back to my Let's Play of Chaos Head Noah. So, eight down, one left to go. All we have left now is the blue sky ending, and then after that, we will be done with Chaos Head Noah. And we'll be able to move on to a new series. So... I've been informed that uh, the Blue Sky ending is approximately only an hour long, so there is a good chance this could end up being a relatively short episode compared to my usual uh, two-hour two-hour output, which you know, give or take two hours. So, in order to uh, both pad out a little extra time after we get through uh, the, after we get through the ending proper, what I'm going to do is number one, check out the alternate endings for uh, for Chaos Head, which there should be five in total. Three, which I can see uh, on on the tile screen by just waiting and doing nothing, and the other two being within the extras menu, according to uh, what one of my uh, viewers has informed me about. And then after that, I'm going to uh, go into a, a theory or two I have. Probably mainly just one theory, yeah, because I think it's probably the most relevant thing here that in regards to the story as a whole. And that's bit, and it, and it relates to co the committee of 300 and what I think they, what 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 I think that they are. We know who they are, or rather who they claim to be, but what I'm what I want to know is what they are exactly because I am skeptical that uh, though that the committee of 300 is basically 300 individual gods for la for lack of a better term that uh, have the ability to uh, om omnipotently view and influence the reality that uh, Chaos Head Noah takes place in, along with any, along with many other districts that they claim to to have under their jurisdiction, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here, so I'm going to save uh, the theory and the exact details I have uh, I, that I've gotten. Yeah, I'm going to save the details for my theory till after we get through everything, so I have a little something to talk about because who knows. There could be something in the Blue Sky ending that could either lead some additional credence to this theory, these th theories I have, or disprove them. So I think it's probably for the best that I just shut up about it until after I get through the whole game, and then I'll just talk about it. So, with all that being said, let's do this. Blue Sky. Chapter 10, Blue Sky. Nishijo Nanami ga inoru. Ani to tomo ni shuyo sareta bioin. Kega nin ga afureta machi aishitu no katasumi ni uzukumari. Jitsu no ani no shiwakucha no te o nigiri shimete. Migi te no itami ni taete.目を閉じて祈る。もう一人の兄の無事を。醜く変形してしまった
その校舎の屋上で空を見上げて神話が書かれた文庫本を握りしめて崩壊した渋谷を覆う不特定多数の妄想が見せる悪意の痛みに耐え目を閉じて祈る彼女の歌を彼女の話を聞いてくれた少年の無事を折原梢が祈る新鮮駅の薄暗いホーム青い瀬名の震える手を握りしめて足の傷の痛みに耐えて目を閉じて祈る心の声で語り合ったクラスメートの少年の無事を青い瀬名が祈る横たわる父の傍らに座り父の冷たくなった手を握りしめて最後まで素直になれなかった後悔の痛みに耐えて目を閉じて祈る彼女のお願いに不器用ながら答えようとしてくれた少年の無事を咲畑リミが祈る冷たい床に横たわりながら彼へ伸ばした自らの手をきつく握りしめて傷だらけの彼の姿を見て感じた締め付けられるような胸の痛みに耐えて目を閉じて祈る自分が守ろうとした自分を助けに来てくれた少年の無事を僕は何もできなかった君が行動したんだ This is all taking place during the, the main confrontation between Takumi and Narose during, uh, during the first story route, isn't it? Because this is all very familiar to me. So, in the end, everyone has seen you. You are a very important part of your life. You are a very important part of もうすでに君こそが僕僕は君は誰君は僕は、oh. well, this is definitely different you are me I wonder what would happen if I get these wrong. Would it just boot me back to the main tile screen and I just simply gotta try all over again? One way to find out, I guess. So I, I guess I'll do is I'll just try answering these without consulting the guide. You are me. You, I assume, referencing Shogun, in which case, yeah. We're kind of one, we're kind of two sides of the same coin here, so. Same answer as before, yeah. No, there's two of you. Shogun is definitely real, so no. You are your own person, so I disagree with you there.
Well, yeah, to both you and Shogun. Showing all the different routes, too. That's cool. But yeah, I'm Nishijo Kun. Well, how about that? It looks like the other ending. It looks like the other story routes do have some relevance in the true ending route after all. Interesting. This one still uh, breaks my heart, though. And in this one, we just simply got played big time by the three ele 300 elephants in the room. Which, again, I will address later when it's relevant. あなたは僕は僕。僕は妄想の存在。Delusionary, yes. But you exist all the same. Mm-hmm. その声が聞こえた瞬間に意識が僕を固定した。ぐちゃぐちゃに書き回されていた世界が一気に収束する。I'm assuming I got it right. All the choices I made, I mean. I didn't even look- I didn't look at the guide, I just followed intuition. I can see clearly now. The rain is gone! All my wounds healed. My top and bottom halves are connected. I'm standing on my own two feet. The pain is entirely gone. Serenity fills my heart. <laughs> I notice Rimi at the edge of my vision. She's okay. She's looking at me. Tears are falling down her face. Don't cry. This is interesting. Do I get to choose which one I want to use? Directly behind me, space begins to warp. 
prayers are brought into creation. The six Gospels, or perhaps the impulses of six spirits, all too pure, all too graceful, all too dignified, all too sharp, all too ferocious, all too destructive, and all too awash with an ill-omened beauty. I accept every piece of them. The six blades writhe above. Wistfully, or perhaps rapturously, they raise their shrieks. Oh, I see. This is like a power. This is an all your powers combined situation. Fine by me. And fuse with my D sword. Hey, Nerose, take a good long look at my glow stick of destiny. Pretty cool shit, I gotta say. Summoning my strength, I grasp the D-Sword's hilt. I ascertain its feeling. My arms work better than ever. I've completely regenerated. I know! It's the coolest glow stick that ever glowed, wouldn't you say? I focus my eyes on Nerose. So I can rescue Rimi. So I can destroy Noah too. Nerose's response is swift. He has yet to harvest the code sample of Nishijo Takumi. The delusion was supposed to corner the boy and shatter his psyche, but now the tables have turned. And that he cannot allow. Nerose closes a gap between himself and Takumi. Taking a specific angle, he swings his D-sword from below. With a D-sword that can cleave any known object, he diagonally carves through Takumi's chest. The target's durability makes no difference. Killing a person with it is as simple as slicing through a block of gelatin. With one quick swipe from Nerose, Takumi's body is split into pieces. His head, right arm, and right shoulder all slide cleanly off his body. Jello Man Power! Activate! Internal organs litter the floor, but not a single drop of blood falls with them. The lower half of Takumi's body begins to give way. He braces himself and manages to plant his feet. In the following moment, the cross section of his wound begins to undulate and squirm. bubbling noise ensues. In this following moment, the cross-section of his wound begins to undulate and squirm, and then he regenerates, unharmed, unaffected. Even though his body was cleaved apart a mere second ago, already a new head, right arm, and shoulder were born. His old head and internal organs remain where they slid free from him. With a single step, Takumi approaches Nerose. Nerose clicks his tongue, then turns over his D sword.
あんたの見せてくれた妄想のおかげだよ。He's unable to retain his shape as a human being. He took in the delusion and made it his own. This is not regeneration, but replacement. Missing parts replenish. Flesh and bone are produced once again, all propagating infinitely from the dust within his body. His shape is not fixed. Like an amoeba, like a collection of slime, he can change himself freely. That is the reason Takumi calls himself a monster. No, you're not a monster, Takumi. You're just a giant starfish. Because starfishes can also、uh, lose limbs and regenerate them. Takumi takes yet another step towards Narose. Narose's frustration increases. Gripping the hilt, he thrusts his ste sword at the approaching Takumi. Takumi's head finds itself between a colossal pair of scissors. No, Ushinaiba. Mosu wa dekinai de shu. Here's the problem, Narose. A starfish's brain is, com is contained all throughout its body, so even if you cut off one,、uh, one limb, there's still the rest of the brain that is still able to regenerate the portion that is lost. So, brain damage to a starfish like Takumi is only a temporary inconvenience. Takumi's head is crushed. It splits like a watermelon. Blood and gray matter burst forth. Everything above the neck is gone. And yet, Takumi's body remains. Regeneration, replacement, is instantaneous. As soon as his heel hit the ground, as if nothing happened, as if he was entirely replaced. His head returns right to where it was without a single scratch. Narose awakens to an understanding. He cannot win this fight. The Gigolo Starfish is about to win yet again, ladies and gentlemen. Physical attacks with his D sword are useless. The delusional attack denying the boy's reason for existence was taken in. And used for an alternate purpose. The current Nishijo Takumi is. all too removed from human nor normalcy. Yeah, he's a starfish! All too distorted of an existence, like a starfish! All too fitting as a monster. Again, like a starfish. And yet, despite it all, Nerose has no intention of conceding. His next thought is to utilize Noah II's power to bombard Ta Takumi with innumerable antiparticles. Bombardment with antiparticles can transform any known existence into negative matter, ending ultimately in self collapse. If disruption from the surface is not viable, then collapse must be undertaken from within. So, Nanda, ne? Nerose's thoughts were read by Takumi. <gasps> The shine of Takumi's D sword transforms from red to black. A black flame envelops the blade. It wriggles forth, extending outward. Its shape resembles that of. Starfish? A dark, colossal serpent. Of course, it's the serpent. It roams throughout the dome as if constrained by it. Towards the ceiling, toward the floor, as though it is licking them up, as though it is scra scraping them away. It simply consumes.
The body of the Colossal Serpent is composed of antiparticles. With a mere touch, it can send any known object to just self-collapse. A torrent of destruction composed of near-infinite greed. Funny you should mention to tentacle porn, considering I've been on a starfish tangent for the past few minutes. There and then, Takumi's D sword swings, his pointed tip fixed on Narose. Here we go yet again! The Dark Serpent, winding itself in a coil, curves its body like a whip. Its jaws snap at Narose. Not once has Narose ever seen such a phenomenon from a D sword. He cannot discern whether it is the hidden power of all gigalomaniacs or merely Takumi's delusion. Given how all the so all of um, the other gigalomaniac swords converged into Takumi's, which in turn allowed him to pull this off, I would say it's probably the former. That this is probably something that all Gigalomaniacs can theoretically do if they just simply focus all their uh, powers into one particular individual. Act as like amplifiers, if you will. At least that's how I look at it. The dark things erode Narose's body, and he begins to collapse. All too slowly, like a frog slowly dissolving in the belly of a snake. Darkness swallows him. He feels no pain. By nature, his death should be instant. Why that is not what Takumi wishes for. Realizing this, Narose's lips twist into a derisive smile. Narose had no fear of death. One could say that the ideals he pursued were accomplished with the completion of Noah too. Nerose is God's inventor, so to speak. As long as Noah II continues to exist, mankind will not perish, and the eternal utopia Nerose seeks will become real. However, <laughs> the serpent's body wriggles and rises with Nerose in its grasp, lifting his body into the air. Nerose is astonished. But soon enough, his face changes into an expression of pure agony. The serpent swings about at his body with ease. Takumi shoots a glance at Rimi. Their eyes meet. Just what is Rimi feeling as she watches him? Reading her mind would be effortless. And yet, Takumi does nothing of the sort. It seems I was able to save you after all. He quickly averts his eyes. His gaze then shifts his still humming Noah too. The throne of God, where none may stand foot. A cradle which shows naught but dreams of bliss. Oh, man. He apologizes to no one in particular. The eternal utopia this device would bring. A future without conflict. Takumi will extinguish them with his own two hands. Is that right? Or is it wrong? Takumi cannot give the answer to that. 
でも神話でもよくあるでしょう神だって女がらみでうだうだやってる When it comes to the Greek gods, at least, that's definitely true. We'll sacrifice the happiness of mankind out of the love for a girl. Takumi, D sword in hand, bends his arms in a giant arc. He thrusts forth. Just like a javelin, the colossal serpent of darkness charges straight ahead. With the bait known as Nerose impaled by its tip, it flies straight toward Noah too. An enormous serpent of antiparticles, capable of terminating any known object. It had no will of its own, thus, it is not something that could be warped nor distorted. With the greedy impulse to destroy, Using the Rose as the key. The delusional barrier is easily smashed to pieces. When did the rain begin to fall? There was just a huge explosion. And its blast. Its blast blew my body away like it was nothing more than a rag doll. Next thing I knew, I found myself lying here. Those eyes are always watching me. The stare pierces through the thick, pitch black rain clouds and pours down on me like rain. Don't look at me. My body won't stop shivering, not from the chill of the rain, but rather the ice cold rubble pressing against my back. So terribly cold. A gaze pierces me from the heavens, who it belongs to. I can't say. As if to escape it, I raise my head to look at the environment around me. There I see a ruined city. There I see despair. There I see death. There I see nothingness. Not a soul is there. Not a soul is moving. Not a soul is left alive. The only thing I can hear is the sound of the rain continuing to pour. At this rate, everything, both the living and the dead, will it all be gently embraced and washed away? How nice it would be if all of this was just a delusion, but that doesn't seem to be the case. I can't move my body. I can only move my eyes and neck, and even then, just barely. I can't use that monstrous power from before. My body is shivering, but that's nothing more than a physiological phenomenon. It isn't happening by my own will. I don't want my body to tremble. If I can't move it freely, then it isn't my body. Or maybe I never had free will ever since I was born. Nobody knows exactly where the soul resides. Bearing that in mind, how can anyone say that there is a soul inside this body of mine? But then, where exactly am I now? Am I 
really here? Am I anywhere at all? In this shattered world, where all stands still, where all that can be heard is the rain of death, suddenly, a nurse sound echoes through it. A single, solitary existence begins to emerge from the sea of nothingness. Who are you? Is your skin so pale? Because it's been numbed by the chill of the rain? Or is it because you're already dead? And yet, the girl isn't shivering. And those eyes of hers, nearly hidden by her bangs, Don't look at me. They look so terribly sad. They look as if they hold a hint of madness. They look as if they reflect nothing. If... If she and I were the only ones left in the world. If we stared into each other's eyes like this for all eternity. Would my world be reduced to the reflection in her eyes? Would her world be reduced to reflection in my eyes? The only thing reflected in her eyes is me. The only thing reflected in my eyes is her. When I think of it that way, the world immediately seems so much smaller. <gasps> Suddenly a flash of stack reaches my ears. One endlessly beautiful, yet deeply discordant. She lowers her head and spreads her arms wide. Almost as if preparing to take off, to soar high above the rain clouds. Or as if trying to catch all the falling rain. From where I am on the ground, I can't see the expression on that lowered head of hers. Behind this thin veil of rain, just what kind of face are you making? This again? An angel? Are those dancing feathers of light blessing me? Or... You're not gonna actually kill me this time, right? Since, since this is the true ending and everything, will you actually spare my life this time? Could you please show me that one little bit of kindness after everything I've been through? Ah, I see, I finally understand. She's going to use that to kill me. The girl slowly kneels to the ground, right before my collapsed body. With her head still lowered, she gently takes my own in her hands. This isn't going to help Shogun, you know. I surrender my body to her get grasp. I'm just relieved that she isn't looking at me. <laughs> In my ear, I hear a whisper. Garbled by static, it's as beautiful as it is discordant. <laughs> Do I got advanced a text? There's nothing to apologize for. If I don't disappear, the other me, the real me, will die. He's going to die regardless. So, that's why I'm okay with this. In fact, I'm really glad I get to be erased by you. It's not a bad end for a monster like me. I don't have any regrets. Warm, soft, gentle, sweet sensation. And miraculously, as if it were an anesthetic, 
the shivering in my body slowly begins to die down. Her soft breath tickles my cheeks. It smells so sweet. Suddenly, I sense something pressing against my chest. The large sword she holds tears through my skin, bores into my flesh, wheezes through my bones, and slowly sinks to the center of my body. God damn it! But, given the anesthesia of her kiss, I no longer feel any pain. I would never have imagined I'd get such a kind death. Just the thought of it breaks my heart, leaving me on the verge of tears. Trying to hide them, I look past the girl's head up toward the ashen sky where the rain continues to pour. Did you hear me? Are you actually going to give me mercy this time? Her lips pull away from me. Her sad whispers trickle into my ears. Yeah, buddy. If it's any consolation, you're able to do it several times in the other story route, so don't knock yourself too hard now. I feel no pain. Her sword isn't real booted. My body isn't injured in the slightest. Even though it's not real booted, it's not nice to stab people with, with swords, you know. Demo. No, she doesn't. We'll die. He will die. That's why I should die instead. He's already going to die regardless of what happens to you, Takumi. He already said as much numerous, several times now. And not just to you, either. He's doomed. That way, he can stay alive for just a little bit longer. I'm sure that's what you want, too. Kiss it. Kiss it. I can't do it. Rimi lightly shakes her head. Those eyes of hers waver as they stare at me. Well, you're definitely different from most women in this regard. Yeah, when you put it like that, I wouldn't really call him weak, then. Considering that most people uh, would rather not get torn apart under any circumstance. So, if anything, he's got a strong character to have gone through all that. Or at least he does now. He certainly didn't for most of the story leading up to this point. But now, some good old character development put some, uh, has put some metaphorical ab muscles on him. And now he's got a six-pack. I'm sure he'd like that. Gives he gives him an audience to uh, flex his uh, character muscles towards. You'll look at me. Okua. Bakemono nanda. 
私だって同じだよ Is it、okay? For me to keep on living? 君がそれを選んだなら生きていていいんだ I hear a voice from the sky and with that I understand because our minds are directly connected I perceive a certain feeling that right now at this very moment His life just vanished. In that moment, Rimi quickly sensed the emotions my face conveyed. Hesitating for a moment, I gave her a faint nod. Get used to it for the next two hours at least. Feelings return to my entire body. Warmth returns to my body as well. Even though my movements are still clumsy, even though I'm still trembling. But the hand I can move, I take out a vermilion handkerchief. Remy's face is covered in tears. The droplets that are so beautiful, so clear. I softly wipe them away from all the memories you've given me. Pokemon. Kimiga Skides. Rimi tightly clasps my hand as if she wishes to cling to it forever. As if to confirm that we exist right here. The warmth within us is contagious. Both my and your temperatures melt together. Two of us look up at the sky. Without a doubt, it's covered by clouds. But. Words that only he and Rimi should know. Words that he used to give Rimi hope. And yet, I know them because I've seen his memories. He and I are one body. One in body and soul. My memories and his are shared between us. His memories of the 17 years of life he lived were all passed down to me. And he vicariously experienced my own year and a half of life. We know that color. Because, in that image world of only sea and sky, it's the color we gaze up at and burned into our memories. Suddenly, the rain stops. In an instant, the clouds vanish. It's clearing up, coming back. Something that, no matter where you look, always seems to draw you in, gently blankets the world. The blue sky above.
I have to look at you at the end of this cred sequence. Well, hey, at least you seem to be abandoning the rubble, so good riddance. Reach the blue sky ending. The prelude to Delusion of Zero has been unlocked. Prelude. Congratulations! Feels like someone's straight out of an old 1990s video game. Getting a little congratulations, PNG, at the end of it. How nostalgic. Oh, hey! It all changed! And there it is! Blue sky! And we only have a 98% achievement rate for the album, which I assume is for the CG, so... Well, this is interesting. I thought um, there would only just be the blue sky ending thing left and that and then we'd be done effectively. So what's this? Delusion of Zero, a Chaos Head Prelude. Before I pass on, allow me to recount my memories leading to this moment. Imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world. Those are the words of Albert Einstein. Ah, the big gigalomaniac himself, huh? So it's speculated, anyway. When his delusion, E equals MC, MC, I forget what that symbol means. Two, embrace the world. How had the man felt? Yes, what you surmised is true. The famous gifted physicist was, in fact, a gigalomaniac. Heh! <laughs> Galled it. As did, uh, as did at least one or two people in the story. And a fairly exceptional one at that. My powers undoubtedly pale in comparison to his. Yet, despite my saying so, I unknowingly brought a similar delusion into existence. To deny that reality would be a fool's errand, for my delusion has already spread far across the world. Ah yeah, the IR2 formula. I believe I was in the fourth grade when I materialized that formula. It was also around that time when my body first began to suffer various abnormalities. Ever since its very birth, that delusion has slowly eroded my body. In a mere six months, I was no longer able to walk unassisted. At the time, I was not aware of my status as a gigalomaniac. 
So this is all. So this is all Shogun's um, perspective, huh? I somehow managed to continue attending classes, but I proved unable to participate in an upcoming field trip due to my worsening condition. So it was around. So it was all before that field trip that he manifested the formula, huh? And so, despite my intense anticipation for the event, my parents forbade me from attending, which burbed in me a fierce resentment toward them for a time. From that moment onward, my delusions continued to engorge. Delusions synonymous with nothing but pure envy. These very delusions would go on to injure my classmates, who had gone on the field trip without me, and kill the chaperoning teacher. Only then did I come to realize that I harbored a terrifying power. I was admitted to the hospital soon after. More time would pass, and eventually, all the doctors present gave up on diagnosing my condition. All the doctors, save for one. Narose Genichi. Although I was fairly young when I first encountered him, it only took a glance to understand this man's true, sinister nature. The two of us were alike, after all. Two souls far removed from common sense. Naturally, because of this fact, his proposed treatment for my condition was denied and he was dismissed from my case. I was fortunate in that his su successor turned out to be Dr. Takashina. Before Narose departed, however, I took the time to peer into his mind and learned of both Project Noah and Nozomi technology. The very hospital I had been admitted to also served as the lair of my enemy. If nothing was done, my delusion would be utilized by Project Noah, and grave consequences would befall the world. When I realized this, I immediately attempted to escape. But that was when I grasped a terrifying truth. Only as a result of my treatment had I come to reach a form of stability. In other words, my body had already deteriorated to a point where I could no longer survive outside of the hospital. I was intensely aware of that fact, of the fact that my enemies were always near. I kept them at bay with delusions, but my body grew weaker with each person I stayed. A vicious cycle that only served to further extend my stay at the hospital. If this were to continue, my capture by Narose would, would be inevitable. With no other options left to me, I was forced to erase every trace of my existence. I had ceased attending classes some time prior to that point. So, upon my classmates' graduation from elementary school, I executed my plan. Our treatment of Nishijo Takumi has proven successful, and he has thus been discharged from the hospital. That is the fiction I created. One I implanted into the minds of my parents, as well as the entirety of the hospital staff. Any person who had any possibility of coming into contact with Narose was put under this impression. Then, using my delusions, I isolated myself in a hospital room separated from the rest of the building. But I was not able to alter everyone's memories. My younger sister, Nanami, proved to be an exception. Only she was able to enter the room with no semblance of difficulty. She did not even seem to recognize the room as separate from the hospital. Well, I'd imagine being a giggled maniac certainly helped with that. Of course, whenever she took it upon herself to visit the hospital, I crafted a delusion allowing her to remain unseen by anyone present. Nanami, while quite childish, showed nothing but concern for me during my time in the hospital. Even on my darkest days, 
she put forth her best efforts to care for me. Those moments showed me how strong she truly was, and I found myself unable to steal her memories away from her. Nanami, however, was not the only exception. This was the time I came to know a girl named Sakihara Rimi. Rimi had been confined to the hospital's basement for nearly a year. Every day, she would face brutal, ceaseless torture at the hands of Narose. But no matter how hard I tried to call out to her, my voice would never reach her. It was only upon her eventual awakening as a giggle of maniac that I finally managed to synchronize with her delusion. In that moment, I entered the world inside her mind, her image world. Whether that was truly for the best, I have yet to determine. The delusions she carries within her are endlessly sorrowful, and yet, they are also her reality. Unable to face it, she had killed her own heart and mind numerous times before I met her, destroying all remnants of her past selves. The formula born from my delusions had brought this girl endless suffering. For all these reasons, I saved her. My delusionary powers allow me to travel anywhere. In reality, my body is still incapable of walking but I'm able to create a door that leads to any destination, hence you're able to, while you're able to teleport everywhere. Producing these delusions requires a great deal of strength, however, forcing me to only use it sparingly. And yet, despite this fierce tax on my body, I would not hesitate to give my life if it meant stopping Project Noah, a project I effectively founded when I allowed my delusion to spread across the world. And so, upon isolating myself, I began to pour every ounce of strength into halting the advancement of Project Noah. However, the skill my enemies possessed matched my own, rendering my efforts useless. They had established a defensive strategy, and with it, the search for me had begun. If I were to make even one mistake, I would be discovered in an instant and captured. This manhunt would only serve to increase the danger Nanami was in, as the two of us were family. I had no desire to involve anyone in this fight, so I hid myself away from the world. In the end, I was naive, and three years went by entirely wasted. During that time, I conjured numerous delusions, but each only served to weaken me further. If this were to continue, there would be no way of stopping Project Noah. For this reason, I decided to give birth to you. To Taku. To this end, I had to sever every link I had left to society. My final remaining connection to the outside world, to my normal life, was Nanami. Because of this, I was forced to erase all memory she had of me. I know that my actions caused her a great deal of pain. In her last moments together, it was clear how deeply hurt she was. Even though, so, I knew that pain was sure to leave her momentarily. As long as she forgot about me, she would be able to return to her normal life. Wishing only for her happiness, I liberated her from the burden known as myself. It was with Rimi that I miscalculated. Naturally, I tried to erase her memories as well. I wanted her to forget about her awakening as a giggle maniac, about her sickly torture at the hands of Nerose, and that she had ever met me. I wanted to give her a normal life. However, Rimi is an exceptionally skilled giggle maniac. No matter how many times I tried to overwrite her memories, my delusions were deflected without fail. It was clear she was very experienced in locking away her heart, all while wearing the brightest of smiles on her face. 
My attempts having borne no fruit, I abandoned all hope of altering her memories, and thus redirected my efforts. Creating a human from nothing proved difficult, even with the power of delusions. I've come to know that the human soul is incredibly delicate, that it is as elaborate as it, as it, it is precise. In order to create you, I focused completely on the personality the delusions would form. For an entire month's time, you were all I thought about. In a way, it was quite similar to falling in love, though I myself have never known the feeling. If you were to come to know this, I am sure you would feel repulsed. Essentially, you are me. My memories, my abilities, and finally, my name. I have entrusted them all to you. The moment you were bo are born, I will no longer be the boy known as Nishijo Takami. From that moment on, I shall take on the moniker Shogun. Why Shogun, you may ask? Well, I quite like Togu Shogun. That is all there is to it. Something I will have to look up later. <laughs> With that being said, once you are born, your role will no doubt be a very painful one. First and foremost, you must awaken as a gigalomaniac. To meet this end, you will have to endure an extreme mental load, a grave, unforgiving strain on your psyche. Once you awaken and grasp your D-sword, the battle against Nozomi technology will begin. The battle to stop Project Noah. That is my ultimate goal, and, by extension, yours. But I would be remiss if I did not say this. My reason for creating you was incredibly selfish, but I had no other choice. I cannot do this on my own. I hope you can find in yourself to forgive me. When the curtain finally falls, you will be free. Once you are granted this freedom, please grant me this in turn. I ask that you turn a blind eye to my selfish desires, including forcing these memories onto you. And I ask that you be a good older brother to Nanami. Please. If I had the ability, I would have done all this all myself. I would have done it while dreaming of the peace I would see once it all came to a close. It is a pleasure to meet you, Nishijo Takumi. Yet, this is also goodbye, Nishijo Takumi. Welcome to the world. Harsh battles await you, as do infinite possibilities. As long as the blue sky above exists, that fact can never be denied. You are me. And at the same time, you are also you. A hospital room no, none would visit, dyed orange by the setting sun. Clutching her knees silently in one of the, its corners, Saki had Rimi noticed something strange occurring in Nishijo Takumi's bed. Oh, we switched to Rimi's per perspective now. His breathing had quickened. His chest, reduced to mere skin and bone, rose and fell rapidly with each breath. With a low gasp, Rimi watched as innumerable thorned vines slowly radiated from the bed's center. A delicate construct that appeared both metallic yet organic, with a beauty that did not that rivaled even the most breathtaking of sights. Vines of such description colored the room. They crept and crawled over the walls and floor, overtaking every inch of the closed space the two resided in. Like the veins of a leaf, shards of translucent glass emerged from the surface of the vines each pulsating with a flickering red light. 
Together, it was reminiscent of an eight-headed serpent, each branch possessing its own will. Nishijo Takami's D-Sword. Rimi had seen it only once before, but at that time, it had been confined to one of his weak, frail hands, wrapped around it as tight as could be. Nishijo Takami remained motionless on the bed. In spite of Rimi's attempts to inhibit him, she realized he had been su successful in creating another self. As she gazed upon him, memories resurfaced at the time she had asked him if he intended to die as a result of his actions. To this, he merely nodded. Soon, the pulsing glow of the D-sword covering the walls began to dim, and before long, the vines began to dry and crack. As they crumbled away around her, Rimi slowly rose to her feet. Taking care not to run to any thorns, she cautiously made her way over to the bed. Standing by his side, she lifted her hand and gently caressed Shogun's desiccated cheek. Still, he continued to breathe. Would he ever regain consciousness someday? At that moment in time, somewhere in Shibuya, another Nishijo Takami had been born. Would she ever come to meet him someday? Until that day came, she would continue to wait here, for she had no family, for she had nowhere else to go for she had no home to return to, no one waiting for her. Gazing out the window, Rimi looked to the many skyscrapers of Shibuya, each dyed a deep orange by the twilight, as a single trickle of tears slid down her cheek. All of this came a mere 18 months before the Shibuya collapse. Well, the prelude. I guess, I guess, as far as the prelude goes, it does more or less confirm what could be inferred regarding Shogun's uh, Shogun's stay at the hospital before he had to go into hiding. So I guess it's nice. I guess it's nice to get some actual confirmation on the events that actually led to him not only going into hiding, but also his creation of the other Takumi. But, like I said, it's all stuff that we more or less already knew about and could infer from in the main story, so I don't think it really adds too much other than just uh, too much to what we already knew prior other than just simply hearing his account on things. But I mean, hey, it's something, I guess. So... Let me go to the config thing here. Sound settings. Uh, BGM volume. I'm just going to mute the, mute the background music for a little bit so I can hear myself think. Actually, wait. Yeah, actually, I'll go into my theory first, and then we can just uh, cap things off by checking out the alternate openings. So, my theory. It concerns the 300 elephants in the room, which we were properly introduced to in uh, Sena's route, the Committee of 300. So... Even though, by all appearances, it looks like as though Takumi has basically... Takumi and Rimi have effectively gotten their happy endings. I mean, we don't really see 
what we don't see what happens to any of the, of the characters after the after the true ending. So I mean, who the hell knows? Maybe they could have all been they could have been all captured by other forces that were under the control of the committee of 300 for all I know or maybe they were able to just go effectively start a new life outside of the ruins of Shibuya elsewhere. I have no idea. Maybe this maybe this particular plot point will get will get addressed in uh, later later installments in the Science Adventure series. Maybe so I will just put this put this particular little little thing on the back burner in my mind for well however long I need to really because who knows how long it's going to take me to actually get through all the other science adventure visual novels. Yeah, spoiler alert! I'm going to check out the other one. I'm definitely going to be checking out the other ones even after I get through Steins Gate, which uh, is going to be the sequel to this game. Last I checked. So yeah, I hope those of you. Uh, who are fans of this uh, series are definitely going to are definitely going to enjoy that little bit of news cuz yeah I really want to, I really want to see where the rest of the series go, series goes cuz all things considered I liked the Chaos Head Noah overall it definitely uh, it definitely uh, was quite uh, definitely was quite the intense thriller at times especially in the beginning portions before I understood I understood more and more what was actually going on because I'll tell you one thing. The guy who wrote this thing here could write uh, could I think could write an actual an actually decent uh, horror visual novel if he really wanted to. Like a fully dedicated one. Cuz I'll let me tell you. There were many times where it felt like as though I was experiencing something that belonged to a horror story rather than well Whatever exactly you want to classify Chaos Head Noah overall as a story. Anyway, I got a little sidetracked. So, the Committee of 300. Going by some comments that uh, were left on some videos of mine, and, um, well, mainly in regards to how um, Sena's route or rather what happens in it here is arguably one of the most important uh, sequence of events that occurs throughout the whole series. And given what the Committee of 300 says about them, say about themselves, and what we can probably infer from them if we by reading in between the lines and all this other stuff, I think it'd probably be safe for me to assume that these that these guys are going to be a recurring element within the uh, science adventure series. Maybe I'll learn more about them in Steins Gate. Maybe I'll learn about them in the other Chaos Head game I, that um, I know about. His name I forget at the moment, but whenever that's going to be, whenever the, the whenever it ends up happening, I'm. I think I can be reasonably confident that they're definitely going to be something that I'll, I'll definitely have to keep in the, in the, on in the back burner of my mind too. Considering this the sheer scale of what they represent within what was established in, within this game. They are they effectively present themselves as gods within the setting able to able to perceive able to perceive events that are occurring throughout it omnipotently like a god and also influence influence the fabric of reality even if even if uh, the ways in which they're able to do it are limited which we also were able to confirm in Santa's route and yet, they would have us believe that they are basically the clo they are essentially good, they may as well essentially be gods to all the other characters and the, the whole setting proper. But like what? But like what Sana's father? Like what Sana's father? Like what Sana's father was uh, was speculating when uh, when he Takumi and Sana were first encountering these guys in their route. I'm more inclined to think that the Committee of 300 aren't exactly, uh, aren't, may not necessarily be, be uh, higher beings with uh, incredible powers per se, but they may actually be gigalomaniacs and powerful ones at that. Because remember, 
if they were actual gods, there then it would be it would then I think it'd be reasonable to assume that their powers would make any anything that any of the giggle maniacs that we've seen within throughout the story look paltry by comparison. They they would likely be able to pull off uh, feats of power and uh, and alter reality to such an extent to where they would be effectively unstoppable. And yet, what we saw in Sena's route basically amounted to them hijacking a uh, hijacking a monitor and use it and uh, using the BIOS function of, of said monitor as a as a makeshift chat window to communicate with the with the main characters of that route. And I assume that they also had a hand in manifesting that baby that uh, they had to kill in, in Sena's route too, in order for Takumi to get his cheat code and awaken as a gigolo maniac right then and there on the spot. They weren't able to they weren't able to deal with with the, with the threat that Nerose posed to their plans directly. So they had to rely on so they had to rely on uh, Sena and Takumi who happened to be close bu close enough to where Noah 2 was being ha housed within the within the planetarium to be able to do something about it. So what I think is actually going on with them is they're just gigolo. They're more than likely gigolo maniacs, powerful ones, that are able to that are able to help other gigolo, other uh, unawakened gigolo maniacs, awaken their own powers and create and create limited delusions of their own within the within the world of chaos. Had Noah. Which is why they were unable to directly intervene with Nerose and Noah too themselves, because if they did have the, because if they did have the power of an actual god, well, it would again. I think it would stand to reason that they would be able to easily uh, take care of Nerose and Noah too themselves. But they had to rely on, they had to rely on to Takumi and Sena to do the job for them. And make sure that they uh, prepared a cheat code for them in order for, in order to give Takumi an edge, in order for them to in order for him to be able to attack Noah too. And after they bit the dust, it was just a matter of relying on uh, their on their human assets to do the cleanup work for them, so they can then continue on the, the so then they can continue on their big with their big hair brain hair brained pie in the sky plan to effectively brainwash the rest of humanity on their own terms if they were gods wouldn't they be able to effectively uh, uh, do that all, all, on their own already without having to rely on on anything on well whatever they got planned exactly i mean We've seen that giggle maniacs within this story have the ability to al to alter a normal human's perception of the reality around them by manifesting their delusions into said reality. To a, to a, a non giggle maniac, a, a random flower bed appearing out of nowhere won't won't seem out of place to them, and they'll just perceive it as having all already already been there and have always been there. Their minds would be utterly incapable of registering its sudden appearance as something abnormal. Whereas if you're a gig whereas if you're a giggle maniac, you would be able to perceive it. Don't tell me I just lost in my train of thought. Okay, uh Ah, right. I was talking about uh, them being unable to Deal with Nerose themselves, pro probably because them, probably because of their limitations, which leads credence, which again to me leads credence to the idea that the, that they're probably that the committee of three hundred are probably are probably humans too, and they're are 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 just humans too, and therefore their their ability their ability to affect any threats like Nerose is limited. Even if, even if some of its members, or if not all of them, are also gigolomaniacs themselves, if that makes any sense, because when you're when you're when you're dealing with a situation where you have two gigolomaniacs or a group of gigolomaniacs going uh, going against another uh, powerful gigolomaniac like Nerose seemed to be, then 
it's not going to be as it's not going to be as straightforward it's not going to be as a straightforward affair when you're when you're when you've got opponents on two sides of the aisle that could effectively stand toe to toe with each other even if only for even if only for a short period of time depending on the power discrepancy that's involved and like what we saw with uh, in the true and what we saw in the true ending with uh, all the other characters d swords manifesting the way they did and converging into Takumi's d sword in order to give him a power boost that could be another way that that uh, giggle made that uh, that baby that was used as a uh, as a uh, cheat code for Takumi and Sana's route was probably was able to be manifest. The baby was in all likelihood, as far as I'm as far as I'm speculating, a delusion created for the sole purpose to help awaken Takumi. So if if the giggle so if the committee of three hundred are a bunch of giggle maniacs, I imagine that what they probably did was that they could just simply combined enough of their powers to where they could manifest that baby with that specific function and purpose in mind, and then just place it in a location where Takumi and Sena would be able to find it, and then util and then use it for for its intended purpose, if that also makes sense. And that and that is was essentially the best that they were able to do, like I said before, is Take advantage of the two Gigolo maniacs that were already close to where uh, no, where Noah Two was being housed, and give them a means to be able to attack it directly. Because if they were gods, that would be able to that would be able to intervene and deal with any threats to their power themselves. They should just be able to effectively snap their fingers and then just deal with Nerose right then and there, right? But no. They had to again. I, I know I'm repeating myself here, but I want to I want to stress I want I want to stress these details because I it to me it convinces me that the committee of three hundred aren't higher beings per se, but just probably humans with gigalomaniacs under their ranks. Otherwise, their feats of power otherwise their feats of power would and it would likely be a lot more impressive than what we actually saw in Sena's route. Because think about it, hijacking a monitor to act as a chat window and creating a human is not is not is not something I would imagine would be terribly difficult for your regular average Joe Giggle maniac to pull off. And we already saw and we already saw firsthand that creating a human out of thin air is possible if a Giggle maniac is able to conjure up enough power to do so, which we saw with Shogun creating Takumi. A baby, on the other hand, well, as we saw in the prelude, Shogun had to spend a whole month creating creating Takumi in his mind, his backstory, his backstory, his history, his personality, all that stuff. He had to create a teenage human human boy, and everything that and everything that such a everything that such a person is made out of memories, personality traits, and all. Throughout an entire month, a baby, on the other hand, well, I would imagine that'd be a lot more effortless for a, for a gigalomaniac to be able to create because a baby doesn't a, a baby. Well, nope. As far as I'm aware, no human being in existence actually has any memories whatsoever of when they're an infant, and I think that's because of how a baby's brain is initially structured, as is initially structured throughout the first few years of its life. And as it grows, it's able to develop neurons and such that are necessary in order for it to retain information, and that includes memories. I it's been a long time since I uh, I looked I looked up that information, so I could be mistaken on a few things regard, regarding the neurological development of an infant to young childhood and how that affects a person's ability to retain memories and knowledge. I could be mistaken about that. So feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on that front. But at the very least, a baby, you don't have to create any memories or backstory of. In the, and in the case of Sena, in Sena's route, all you would really need to worry about if you're a gigalomaniac is just to create it at, in order to create, to create the baby to serve a specific function 
that being Takumi's cheat code within that route. At which point, you don't have to worry about backstory or per uh, creating a backstory for the baby or personality or anything like that. It's just a baby. Simple as. Whose sole, whose sole role for existing is to be killed. So Takumi could awaken as a giggle maniac. I would imagine even if even a giggle maniac that isn't as powerful as Shogun would, would might might be able to create someone like that, if you think about it that way, no? But bottom line, like Hatano, so like uh, Hatano was saying about them, I'm more inclined to think that uh, the that uh, the committee of three hundred is just a bunch of snake oil salesmen that are trying to pass themselves off as more omnipotent and more powerful than they actually are. They're not gods. They're probably just a they're probably just a group of really powerful gigalomaniacs that are able to that may be able to collectively uh, pool their powers together in order to create powerful delusions within reality to suit their interests. And speaking of realities, I'm just also rem I'm I also uh, remember them mentioning that uh, they have they have their various members they have their various members in charge of various districts that they call which they called them alternate reality which I think are alternate realities or worlds or whatever they can, whatever you want to call them I don't think you could you should necessarily take I don't think we should necessarily take the, the I don't think we should necessarily take the, the those words the way that they used to describe them too literally and what I mean by that is if a district is an is if a district refers to another world or an, or another reality and if we're and if we're dealing with giglo maniacs a, a giggle maniac has the power to affect the reality that they're currently in by using their powers in order to alter it from either tiny details to significant ones. This, with two significant examples being Albert Einstein and uh, Shogun with their uh, mathematical formulas being the two most noteworthy examples that I can think of. But otherwise, but otherwise, all the other giggle maniacs that we were able to see were only able to affect the world around them on a relatively much smaller scale. Honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know where I'm where I was even going with this. I thought I I thought I I thought that I had something that would that would put I thought I had something that uh, could uh, give some reason could give some reason to doubt that they have the ability to well okay wait a minute now I remember now I now I I got that train of thought again so uh, what if these alternate districts refer to uh, worlds that they see that they would see within their delusions. What if they're able to, well, no, because then that would mean that, that, that would mean that there would be actual alternate worlds that they could travel to probably, or at least influence kind of like a similar to what influence or indirectly interfere with like what we saw in Sana's route. So, but that would then mean that they probably are higher beings. So I don't know. Well, okay, so uh, in the process of uh, trying to explain this one detail, I might have um, cast a ended up casting a little doubt in my own in my, in my own mind in regards to my uh, theory about the Committee of 300 being giggle maniacs, but I still think that that theory probably has more credence of has more likelihood of being true as I currently understand things than the alternative in which they are essentially what they say they are. Just because of how limited how limited their actions actually were in practice, 
when we saw them try to directly intervene in Sena's route. So unless later installments within the Science Adventure series uh, come around to either prove or disprove any of my theories, this is pretty much, I think, what I'm going to be going with for the foreseeable future. That the community of 300 aren't gods per se, but a group of really uh, a group of powerful gigalomaniacs that are working together to enslave the rest of humanity. And I believe that's everything in regards to my current my current theories in regards to uh, what the Committee of 300 actually are, in a nutshell. Now, what else did I want to talk about regarding to this story? Well, I guess I might as well just uh, go over um, briefly go over my thoughts on the different character routes, and then I guess we can end things by checking out the alternate endings, oh, openings, excuse me, and bring this episode to a close. So, the first story route that we got was honestly pretty unsatisfactory in regards to its ending and i believe that's on per and that's and yeah that is on that is def that was definitely intentional because it wa it was basically acting as a setup for us to check out all the other story routes that would follow afterwards leading up to the blue sky ending so i mean i don't really have anything more to say on it than it served its purpose of being intentionally anticlimactic nanami's route uh it ended a bit abrupt, a bit too abruptly for my taste. Other than that, uh, other than that, there, I, yeah, it, it, it ended too abruptly, and I thought, and I felt like there could have been more that could have been done with it in order to uh, explore, in order to explore Nanami and Takumi's relationship and and history, even even more even more than what we ended up actually getting. It felt like only it felt like it only gave me gave us a little tiny taste of what these two characters were actually like were actually like throughout their whole lives before bam third melt hits and everybody dies and then they share one last kiss and then boom credits roll pretty disappointing still I feel all things considered then we have Sena's route, which I was just going over, and well, it was certainly one was one of them. And well, on account of the big th theory regarding the Committee of Three Hundred, I gave here, I think you guys can infer that I certainly find it, in retrospect, to be the most interesting of all the different uh, all the different alternate story routes that this game has to offer, if only because. Of what the committee, if only because of the element of the committee of three hundred and what their existence and the implications their existence has on the setting as a whole, and the uh, and the potential night uh, and the and the potential um, existential nightmare that they also present as well, if you want to look at it from a free will perspective, Kozapi, well. That was just uh, going out of its damn way. That that one just went out of its damn way here to be as dark, diabolic, and tragic as possible. And, well, I mean, hey, all things considered, it did succeed and make me feel the sads at the end of it. It just sucked because it was just pure misery for everybody involved. And, you know, everybody dies at the end, too. So, yeah, there you go. Not much more to say on that, either. Ayase's route, even still, I feel is is the most confusing one, is the most confusing one out, is the most confusing one for me in regards to actually trying to figure out what exactly happened throughout, the, throughout, throughout it. There was... I feel like there was a lot of there were a lot of elements in regards to the actual events that took place and that took place throughout here that were that left that were left unaddressed here. So things ended up happening. So a bunch of stuff ended up happening to the other characters and even to uh, the main stars in question, Takumi and, and Ayase. 
that that which where they just happen, but you, I have a hard time understanding how it happened, if that makes any sense. And even now, I still feel that way. It feels like a lot of events in that in her route ended up just happening, just for just just for the sake of happening. But it doesn't really give me any anything to really work on in order to figure out how they how or why they happened. Other than that, it doesn't really, it didn't really add any uh, much, it, it didn't really add m too much intrigue to the overall narrative itself, like what Sena's route did, I feel. So, all in all, I was kind of, I'm still, I'm kind of disappointed by how, uh, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed by the actual execution of how Ayase's story route actually played out. And, okay, now there's Yua, or rather, should I say, Mia. Quite the plot twist to learn that Yua was actually Mia the entire time, and actually learning about the event, uh, the events that resulted in the, in the two of them sw uh, switching places. Yeah, it was definitely one of the more interesting char uh, character routes out of the whole bunch, I feel. And it definitely, uh, and it definitely, uh, and I, and in retrospect, I think it effectively uh, recontextualized a lot of a lot of event, a lot of previous events throughout the story in a really effective, in a really effective, and interesting way. And hey, she she at least got to live. She didn't. She wasn't able to uh, succeed in her suicide attempt at the end. So yay for that. But other than that, I don't really have much more. I don't really think I have much to. I can re much to really say about it, about you as a route either. Okay, so who else there? Uh, we got. Am I forgetting somebody? Uh, Remy, Remy. Well, I wasn't surprised to see that Remy was turned out to be uh, had to have a, an interesting backstory. To be uh, an interesting backstory, I knew she was going to have something there that would uh, that would uh, that would hook me in. What I didn't uh, what I didn't expect though was just how torturous, literally, her backstory ended up actually being. In, re in regards to how she ended up actually awakening as a gigolo maniac and, you know, eventually uh, making contact with Shogun. I already knew that Nerose was a sick bastard, but... Yeah, he kind of exceeded my expectations in regards to, his, to the sheer sadism that he was capable of, to put it lightly. Which makes me feel even more validated in, in my assessment of his character and his motives back during the first story route, where I say he's a not so, in a nutshell, he's a not so well intentioned extremist. The guy is just a sadistic asshole that just wanted to play the role of God. There was no genuine well. I don't think there. I don't think there was really much well mean, well genuine well meaning to any of his actions at all. I think the guy just simply. Got a kick out of being a dick to everybody, and just wanted to lord and just wanted wanted anything that he could get his hands on that would allow him to lord over the rest of humanity. He essentially wanted to be he he essentially wanted to be what the committee of three hundred uh, claims himself to be, but he didn't want to share the throne with two hundred ninety nine other individuals, if that makes any sense. That's essentially what he, I feel he really boils down to me at the end of the day. Just a big asshole that didn't want to sh didn't want to share his seat with three hundred other with three hundred other other sets of buttocks. Other than that, I mean, hey, at least it was definitely one route where Takumi didn't get and didn't have to bite the dust, although Rimi did. But she also uh, got to. But she also got to get a little bit of revenge against Nerose in that story route too. Put an end to Noah too herself. So I got mixed feelings on the whole thing in regards to. Well, not in regards to its quality, because I, I I I liked her story route just fine in terms of its writing and all that and all that stuff. 
I just had mixed feelings in regards to, well, the emotions it left me with. So it was like I said, it, it was like I said, it was a bittersweet, it was, it was, it was a bittersweet ordeal for me. Oh, for a second, I thought I forgot someone else, but no, I think that's all of them. I think that's all the Gigalomaniacs, the heroines, and then we've got the true ending. Well, we just saw it happen. I mean, it just basically is the for the first story route's ending all, all the way until Remy all the way until Remy is about to plunge her D sword into Takami's chest, and which can, and, and after that it deviates and she doesn't go through with it, and. Rimi confesses her love to him. Re, uh, Takumi confesses back. Shogun dies. They vow to. They vow to uh, live. They vow to live. Yada yada yada. And then, cut to credits. I mean, it's not the most compelling climax I've ever seen by any stretch. In any story I've in any story I've ever seen or read, I mean, it, it serves it, it's just like the uh, first story route. I feel in a lot of ways to where it serves its purpose as being an as being an ending that that uh, leaves things on a hopeful note for the surviving characters, a hopeful note, a bittersweet note, a note where they may be able to rebuild their lives and they will rebuild their lives or start new lives for themselves. Assuming the committee of three hundred decides to not be a bunch of collective dicks and uh, go keep going after them, and well, considering that they are gigalomaniacs, I have very little reason to believe that they would just leave them alone. Like I said, maybe we'll see what happen. Maybe we'll see or learn about what happens to all the other characters in the later installments after the events of this game. I'll be real curious to see if we. I'll be real curious to learn about that for sure. But yeah, in regards to the, this ending itself, it's just meant to be a bittersweet happy, a, a bittersweet happy ending. It's not. It's nothing. It doesn't really do too much. It just does enough here in order to just bring the story to a close. Not, not the most compelling happy, a uh, bittersweet happy ending I've ever seen in a story, but it does its job. And I feel like I'm just repeating myself at this point. So I don't really have anything particularly negative to say about it other than I guess I kind of expected a bit more than what we actually ended up getting. Because in practice, all that really changed was whether or not uh, was whether or not Rimi ended up going through with killing Takumi, and not, not much end up ends up happening shortly after that. And then again, the credits roll. It's a very minor change in the grand scheme of things. Feels like a hell of a lot of effort to uh, go through all the other story routes in order to unlock the blue and sky ending route, only to just get that tiny little deviation of story content. So thinking about it now, I guess it is. I guess it is kind of disappointing when you look at it like that. That you that that's all. That's all the reward you get after being required to go through all the other story content first. But like I said, I also still feel that it's not the worst. It's definitely far from uh, the worst, ex worstly executed, uh, ha bittersweet, happy ending I've ever seen in a story ever. So, I mean, yeah. And I think that's everything. Oh wait, there's that one bad end. There was that one bad. There's that one ending where it's just the definitive bad end for everybody involved. Well, it sucked. It just sucked. It sucked for everybody. It sucked from a writing standpoint because it made me squirm a couple times. <laughs> Fucking serial killer bastards. <laughs> and yeah that's pretty much it really I mean it 
it's just like the, the the true ending and the first ending in that sense in the sense where it's does it it does what it's set out to do and that's to make you feel like you've really gone out of your way to earn that failure you know so in that sense i don't think i can really criticize it because yeah again it does its job but i but it also doesn't leave but 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 by that but that but blah, 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 i'm getting tongue twisted but by that same token it doesn't leave, leave much room for me to say to say much about it either than what i've already said Okay, now that's everything. So, I'm going to put this back on. And I guess what we can do now is we can start checking out these um, other endings. The, I keep calling them endings. I mean, the, I mean the openings. So, yeah, there's five in total. So, guess we might as well check and see what, what they all are. And as for me, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll determine which one I like the most. So I guess for these first three ones, I just gotta sit here for a minute and wait for the first one to play. It's not doing anything. Uh, maybe I should go here? sequences I think okay we got let's check this one right here The art style uh, throughout a lot, and animations a lot throughout a lot of it. I know there's an I know there's a Chaos Head anime that exists. A lot of the art style I saw throughout it reminds me of that. So was this like the was this the anime opening I watched or something just now? Well, either way, I like it. I think it does a pretty decent job of uh, conveying uh, the general tone that a lot that a lot of the story uh, that the law story tends to convey it throughout it pretty well. That being, a lot of crazy and fucked up shit happens throughout it. So yeah, it's got that going for it. Now let's this one.
I'm trying to think, which... I know that a uh, few of these endings um, belong to uh, the to belong to different versions of Chaos Head. One being the for the original version, and another one being for the P PlayStation Vita version. I'm assuming that the one I just watched probably belongs to the original. And I'm assuming this one right here is for the version that I just played, or rather am playing right here now. So let's check it. Yeah, this is the same, this is the same one, I think. how this opening actually spoils Mia's existence. Overall, I consider this ending to be a downgrade from the previous one because it reveals a lot of uh, spoilerific events that occur throughout the story, through, as we saw throughout the whole thing. The key one, of course, being the reveal that uh, that uh, Yua had a twin, Yua had a twin sister. So I mean, it's, this ending spoils a lot of stuff right from the start. It's opening, excuse me, not ending. I keep getting the two damn words mixed up. This opening. Spoils a lot of events, a lot of events throughout here, and I'm I'm never a fan of openings that do that. Same with trailers, where they just uh, take a lot of key take a lot of key events that take place throughout the whole thing, and they just basically cram it all into like something a one to two minute little opening or trailer thing or what have you, and it just kills whatever it just kills the incentive and the mystery for for a lot of it, you know. Maybe not all of it, I mean, I'm depending, but yeah, I feel like this I feel like this one is definitely the worst one out of the ones I've seen so far, just because of how spoilerific it is by, in, by, by comparison to the other ones. Lisa's Lisa song's okay. So what's this one?
I'm assuming going by the low re the low the low resolution compared to the other endings. This is either the PS the PlayStation Vita version, on account of it being a handheld and thus having lower res lower native resolution than um, any other uh, gaming hardware that happened to be out at the time. Or this could have actually been the original ending to opening to uh, Chaos Head. So yeah, I guess between these two, between these two here, I'm not sure which is which here. Is like is one the, is this one the uh, that belongs to the uh, original Chaos Head, or does this one, or vice versa? But I assume it's either that or the Vita version opening that I just saw here. And what's this? Okay, this has got to be for the original because the aspect ratio is 4 by 3. Okay, so that probably was the that was probably for the original Chaos Head here because the aspect ratio for it was a four by three rather than a sixteen by nine or widescreen, whereas all the other ones were. And I will say, as far as story elements I was able to make out from it are concerned, this one is, I think is definitely probably uh, the least spoilerific of the whole bunch. And I forgot to, and, I, and speaking of which, I forgot to mention this little detail. 
But uh, I did notice that this one right here had a few uh, had a few key story elements that were spoiled uh, that were spoiled throughout it as well, but not to the extent that the middle one right here was. So this one wasn't as quite as bad on the spoiler territory. So yeah, that's that's the only other detail I forgot to mention about uh, opening a number four right here. So wait a minute, wait a minute. If this is the if this is the anime opening right here, then these four are prob are for the different versions. So wait, have I actually seen? Yeah, I think I have seen the opening for this version. So okay, give me just a second. I'm just gonna. Reboot the game and see if uh, just booting it to the tile screen before bringing up any of the other options menus will help uh, get the, our fifth opening to start playing proper. So be right back. Oh. Hey. It went back to the original. Or will it actually just re go to the uh, cleaner looking one if I just hit if I just hit any button to start? Nah, eh, I'll just wait a bit. I'll wait until after we get through this last opening and then I'll check. No, this yeah, I did see this one. Okay, yeah, all right. Oh, hey, it changed. Okay, at least we covered our bases and made doubly sure, or at least I did. So. Yeah, again, I, I'm going to assume this belongs to the anime adaption of Chaos Head Noah, so I'm not going to really count. I'm going to discount this and just focus on the, these four here instead, in regards to which will in regards to my personal ratings. Although, like I did, I will say though, like I said here, the Chaos uh, the 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 uh, anime opening here is pretty decent in regards to properly conveying the tone of a lot of the story itself. So I mean, hey, props to it for that. So I think my favorite out of these out of these uh, four openings here is probably this one right here, with this one being a close second. I feel like this one. I feel like uh, this one uh, does uh, uh, bo both does the best job of uh, ke of uh, keeping the amount of uh, key story elements in the opening to a bare minimum, while still uh, while still properly conveying what the story is going to be about throughout it. Plus, you know, the opening song and all that's pretty nice too, and all that. So yeah, I think it's the best one out of the whole out of the whole bunch for for me personally. This one being a close second only because, uh, well, it does spoil a few things in some of its in some of the images. Whereas this one is easily the worst because of how much it spoils. And this one, well, it's in the least spoil, admittedly the least spoilerific of the whole bunch. But well, you know, the four by three aspect ratio does give it an inherent disadvantage compared to it's widescreen brethren so it is what it is but yeah this one's my favorite i think right here 
So I'm going to go right back to the uh, options here and so is there any other thoughts about this game I want to share before I uh, close to close this final episode? Well, Shibuya is in ruin, complete ruins, in pretty much every single, every single freaking ending. And I'm going to assume that the events of the story are going to play a key role, a key role in influencing the events in the sequels in some way, shape, or form. Because I mean, Shibuya, because even. If you're not in the epicenter of what happened within Chaos Head Noah here, I mean, just the fact that all of Shibuya was basically reduced to rubble because of the third melt from Noah 2, I mean, that's going to be pretty much a historic event to the wa wider world at large. So I would not be surprised if, at the very least, it Shibuya's collapse gets an honorable mention of some sort in some of the later in later installments. Now, how much will the event? How much will uh, how much a role will Nozomi play in the, in the later games? I can't really say because uh, Nozomi, as far as I'm aware, was headed by Nerose, and since he's dead, I have no idea if someone else would take over the company and to try to continue. Um, Whatever machination, what all the machinations that Nerose had set into motion with either Project Noah, or uh, work or continue working in tandem with the Church of the Divine Light. I don't know what the Church of the Divine Light for sure is going to do, but I assume they still exist, so they might also be another element we'll have to worry about in future installments. Because I mean, considering what they were involved with. I would not be surprised in the slightest if we see if we see more of them down the road. Now, how much more of a role they'll end up playing, I can't really say, but I don't. But from, yeah, I mean, from both how the founder it's how the founder treated them to everybody else that was part of the uh, team of bad guys. These guys are basically a bunch of, of useful useful pawns to every other villainous faction from the story. Because their fanaticism just makes them so unquestioning of their boss's motiv of their boss's motivations and plans. So, if nothing else, I imagine they're, that if these get, that if the Church of the Divine Light continues to make any appearances later on in the other science adventure series, they'll probably also serve as uh, basically mook factories or or yeah, mook factories for other bigger bads within the story. If that makes any sense. And that's probably the bare minimum that they'll likely do. Uh, what's her name? Whose name I, for some reason, always seem to forget. I have no idea. What she well, seeing as how the tr how the blue sky ending seems to just basically uh, follow all the story beats of the first story route all the way until Rimi decides not to kill Takumi, I think we can infer that she's alive too. And given that given uh, that uh, we learned what her what her true role is within the story in Sena's route, that being an observer. For uh, the uh, for the committee of three hundred, I don't know. Well, who knows? Maybe she'll, maybe they'll have her on standby or something, and we'll never hear from her again or whatever. Because I mean, in the grand scheme of things, she's not that major a character, all things considered. So, I would not be surprised if we never see or hear anything from her again. And chances are. The Committee of 300 has got a lot more a lot more observers like her planted all throughout the world. So, if we're going to be dealing with observers of any kind later on in the other in the other science adventure games, chances are they're going to be different people. So, yeah, we this this is probably in all likelihood going to be the last that I think we're going to see of her. 
but if nothing else, she does. She has a. She does serve the purpose. She does serve a purpose in revealing that the Committee of Three Hundred has human agents that uh, help act as spies for them and act as the, the cleanup crew for any messes that they want that the committee wants to have cleaned up. Which again leads credence to my idea that the Committee of Three Hundred are probably just human beings that have giggle maniacs under their belt. And that they can't do, and they can't do everything with their powers in order to uh, clean up any messes that may put a, put a threat to their plans. Because as human beings, they even with the power of Gigabyte Maniacs, they are inherently limited in their in their ability to affect the world around them. So yeah. Sume Academy is probably uh, going to be closing down because the whole place was basically designed to be a containment facility for the Gigolo Maniacs that were under the observation of Nerose and Nozomi, so uh, and the Church of the Divine Light. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I would not be surprised if uh, that if that school is just basically toast at this point and it's going to just be. Nothing but a footnote in the annals of the annals of history. And I think that's pretty much all the uh, big importance, the big important stuff I can think of here that deserve a mention. Other than that, there's nothing nobody there's nobody or nothing else i can think of that i think really needs to be focused on all that much if at all so in a nutshell i think that the the events of this story are going to indeed have a significant impact on the future installments how much of an impact that'll be i don't i don't know for sure but i can't imagine it being small Considering that, you know, again, all of Shibuya was basically laid to waste in virtually every single story route in this thing. So I think it's safe to assume that Shibuya getting flattened like a pancake is pretty much going to be a canonical event in later games in this series. And at that point, it'll just be a matter of uh, figuring out what's going to rise from the proverbial ashes, so to speak, of Shibuya. And I guess maybe we'll find, we'll start to to get some answers on that on in Steins Gate when I eventually get around to covering that game. So, yeah. I think that's everything. That's all I have to really say at this point. So let me put this back. Well, like I said, I had fun with I had fun with Chaos Head Noah, and I am definitely curious to see what the rest of the uh, science event uh, of the other science adventure games are like, because. If this is basically meant to uh, be uh, essentially the introdu introduction to the, the science adventure series, what I'm hopeful for is that uh, the quality uh, that that the quality of the, the story writing will continue to improve from here as uh, this universe gets to it gets fleshed out more and more in later installments, which I'm assuming it will. Or to put it another way, I'm curious. I'm de I'm definitely curious to see how Steins Gate may or may not up the ante from Chaos Head Noah in terms of writing and the stakes, the story, whatever. Or to put it yet another way, I hope Steins Gate ends up being uh, ends up being a better sequel to Chaos to Chaos Head Noah. Taking uh, taking uh, wh whatever lessons were learned throughout the creation of uh, Chaos Head and you know Chaos Head Noah, and then using those lessons to make an even better uh, make an even better sequel that would that will end up surpassing this one in terms of overall quality. That's my hope anyway, because I definitely think that uh, 
The people that made this thing definitely have definitely have it in them to make something truly special that will stand out. And hopefully they'll and hopefully they'll realize their potential in uh, later installments, or at least I will see whether or not they realize that it's that potential in later installments. So with all that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, final episode of Chaos Head Noah. And if you did, and you'd like to see more content from me, feel free to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. And I will see you next time for my uh, latest Let's Play series that I'll be doing after this one. Take care, everyone.